Okay, in this lecture, uh, we want to start moving towards using variational methods um, uh, in in finite element analysis. So, so uh, thus far, we've we've mostly um, discussed arbitrary or general functionals. Uh, now, what we want to do is uh, let, we'll turn to a, a time-dependent problem in structural mechanics. So, uh, not necessarily in this lecture, but that's where we want to uh, head. Okay, so first I want to give uh, some definitions. Okay, number one is we'll just we want to define a system, and all a system is is the physical structure, the supports, and all the applied loads. Okay, the second item we want to talk about is what's called the configuration, and all all the configuration is it's the set of positions of all the particles uh, in a structure. And then we want to talk a little bit about system characteristics, in particular, if a system is what's called conservative. Okay, so what does it mean for a system to be conservative? Um, it means that all the work done by the internal forces and the external loads uh, are path independent. Okay, what that means is that uh, how I get from the initial to the final configuration uh, is irrelevant to what the final configuration looks like. So if we have a system like that, uh, we, we would call that system conservative. So because a conservative system's behavior is path independent, then um, it depends only on the initial and final configurations. Okay, and because of this, um, it has a potential energy that includes the following. Primarily, we focus on two features of the potential energy. One is the strain energy. Um, and that's going to be the strain energy of uh, elastic distortion. Okay, And the second feature of potential energy is going to be the potential energy of the applied loads. Okay, We usually uh, define strain energy and we, we denote it with U and we denote the potential energy of the applied loads with omega, okay? The combination of these uh, two uh, 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 potential energy types, strain energy and the potential energy of the applied loads, if we combine those, um, we get what's called the total potential energy of the system. And we typically denote the total potential energy of the system with a capital pi, okay? Okay, so now we have all the definitions, uh, we can state what's known as the principle of stationary total potential energy. So what this principle states is that among all admissible configurations, and when we talk about admissible configurations, we mean those configurations that are uh, internally compatible and satisfy essential boundary conditions. Okay, so among all those configurations of a conservative system, those configurations that satisfy the equilibrium equations are the ones that extremize the total potential energy. We could say, you know, they, they extremize, or we know that to extremize means to make, make it a stationary point, so we'll say, or make stationary, the total potential energy. Okay, so we'll do an example uh, to illustrate this in a second, but what this basically means is that if you can write down the total pot potential energy of the system, and you can take its variations that are equal to zero, extremize that functional, um, then the the solution that you obtain uh, is, is the solution that satisfies the equations of equilibrium. So let's do a, a quick example with a linear uh, spring and an axial load. Okay, I know this is a very uh, simple example, but it's going to illustrate all the critical features that we need to think about. Okay, so here's our initial configuration. So that we have some spring, okay, with some uh, with some spring constant k. Uh, we'll, we'll say that this is the initial length. We'll call it L. Uh, I'm going to draw a force P coming off of it. Um, it's it's important, and this will be obviously x. 
Okay, it's important that I put P even in the initial state because how we define um, the potential energy of the applied loads is a little bit non-intuitive. So uh, kind of follow along with me here. So this is the initial or reference state. And then we could draw our final or our deformed state. I'm obviously exaggerating a little for effect. There's K still. Okay, so now this distance is uh, L uh, plus D, where we've deformed it some amount D. Okay, we still have P being applied there. Okay, and so if I were to be, uh, maybe try to be something similar, I'd say that this distance here is D, something like that. Okay, so this would be our final or our deformed configuration. Okay, so as, as I said before, uh, we can combine the strain energy component and the potential energy of the applied loads to get the total potential energy of the system. So let's write the total energy, total potential energy of the system as follows. And we'll write this as pi, right? That's the total potential energy is equal to U, the, the potential strain energy, plus omega, which is the potential energy of the applied loads. We'll call that equation one, then I'm gonna label these so you, so you have them in your notes. This is the total potential energy. Okay, this U is the strain energy, and omega is the potential energy of the applied loads. So let's first talk about the strain energy term, because I think that's the one that's uh, most familiar to people. Right, the strain energy uh, for, a, for a spring is given as follows. We would write U, and we know this is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to D, that's as the displacement goes, of whatever the force is, uh, times D, uh, dx. Um, if I now make the assumption of a linear spring, right, then I can write that that's the integral from 0 to D. Linear spring looks like kx dx, right? And then uh, if I carry out that integration, I end up with one half uh, k uh, d squared, right? Which is which is what you're familiar with. Let's call that equation two. Okay, now let's talk about the potential energy of the applied loads. So before we begin uh, sort of defining that, I want you to note that the load P is regarded as always acting at its full value, okay? Uh, that full value being P, right? Uh, so in moving through displacement D, it does work in the amount P times D. Okay? So if it does that, that means that it loses that amount of potential energy. So the potential energy uh, then of the applied loads in the final configuration uh, is given as follows, right? It's going to look like omega is equal to now negative P times D. Let's call that equation three, right? Because that's how much uh, it lost as it moved through D. Okay, I want to point something out about equation three, that omega is independent of any of the properties of the spring. That's a critical feature. The potential energy of the applied loads is not dependent on the properties of the system, okay? Okay, so now it's going to be fairly straightforward. We're going to substitute equation 2 and 3 into equation 1. And when we do that, we end up being able to write that the total potential energy pi is equal to 1 half kd squared minus pd. Okay, we'll call that equation 4. So now, uh, if we apply our, uh, our principle of stationary total potential energy, we should be able to extremize this functional and um, recover the equations of equilibrium. So let's let's check that out. So let's take the first variation and set it equal to zero. So here, here we go. Uh, delta pi is equal to zero. And what's that variation look like? Well, that's going to be one half uh, k. And then this variation here will look like uh, 2d uh, delta D, and then this other would look like P times delta D. And our two cancels with our one half there, all right? And we're left with the quantity K uh, D minus uh, P times delta D 
right, is equal to zero. Let's call that equation five. So now you know what we're going to do. We're going to invoke the fundamental lemma of variational calculus, right? And when we do that, we end up with that k times d minus p equals zero, right? Uh, which implies what? That implies that p is equal to k times d, right? That's f equals kx, right? That's the equation governing the spring. Call that equation six. So I'll just say which is the equilibrium equation for the spring. Okay, so this isn't a proof of the of the principle, but it's an illustration of the principle. Um, and we're going to use this principle as long as we can write down the the potential energy. We, we're going to be able to use it to uh, to solve our uh, our problem. And so the next thing we want to focus is what's the potential energy look like in an elastic body. Um, and, and why are we doing all this? Uh, it's because we can use the variational method to also uh, not only develop these exact solutions, but we can use them to help us develop approximate solutions as well.